I want to thank everyone here, and that goes for Daniel and Stephen and Amanda and all the folks that I'm meeting and hope to get to know better. I thank you. It's so humbling to think that not only would someone recognize my father, but to recognize his accomplishments as well has been such a rewarding experience for me. And I first was acquainted with Stephen just about two years ago when we started this. He called me up and he said that he'd been in contact with Mary Zunick over at the, uh, it's the Hot Springs Arts and Cultural Alliance. And they were putting together, they wanted to honor my father for his 100th anniversary. That, of course, when we were in COVID, we delayed it. We were planning to have it in 2020 and it moved to 2021. And from there continued to mushroom and balloon. We started out very, very small. And we just, as we went along, we were able to continue to get this wealth of information that had been hidden. It was almost he and his, not only accomplishments in his name, had become obscure. He, as this very, very powerful force in the 50s, 60s, and even the 40s, on through almost to the time he died in 1991, his presence across many, many different genres was so unique, and he was so well known in that era that to think that he was suddenly going away and it, no one could hardly remember because, of course, it was an age factor, too. A younger generation, they were in their whole music had evolved differently. And the same with me being of that era of 70s and 80s. But aside from that, I had a genuine interest in a real curiosity in genealogy. Primarily because I have this innate sense of, well, where is it coming from? What are we going to do over here? How did this come about? And I have been very fortunate and blessed to be able to travel. And through my travels, especially in the United States, I would go into Oklahoma. I would go over to New York. I would go into South Carolina. And there was, and I try to express this because I found it very, very moving as I would step into, for instance, um, Charleston many years ago, maybe even 30 good years ago. And there was something about when I walked into Charleston, South Carolina, I felt like I was walking on sacred ground. Come to find out, Many years later, as I started doing this genealogy uh, research, and I was with one of the organizations, the genealogists, and we were up in North Carolina, it was, and I, was, I went up, I always like to join groups and learn, basically. It's always, well, how can I increase my knowledge? And for my own purposes, so that I can share it with generations. I, I think we, and then with others. So many of us really don't know a lot about our past and where we came from. And I think that it helps to have you grounded. You'll be grounded once you know that information and it's well documented. And now with technology, it's even more so. It's just a plethora of information that you can find out about periods of time. What was going on in 1920? What were the, what were the overall morals, characteristics, typical jobs, typical lifestyle. So I don't want to get aside from what I was trying to say about Charleston, South Carolina. So I'm sitting up in this meeting with these, I mean, they were true, pure genealogists. I mean, they were serious. So I walk in and I say, oh, I'm doing a great job with this genealogy. And I have located that my Glover family they were from Arkansas. And they said, well, don't be so fast about that, Sherry. They said that the Glovers really did
did originate in South Carolina and North Carolina. And they were very, very old families of Glovers. So that piqued my interest and I said, wow, maybe that's the connection that when I would go into Charleston, I would feel this sense. So moving right along, I've always, I found that historical societies really hold this information. They, they're, they're not any cabinets of curiosity like most people think. They have all types of data, records, census, interesting pieces, news articles, photos, and you can just spend, and, and because they're nonprofits, it doesn't cost you a lot to do this research. You just have to have the, I think the self-drive and the ambition to want to, you're curious, you, you want to inquire and find out. So uh, once I, I said, well, you know, I'm going to study this a little bit more. So I would, I would go with my daughter on her business trips. Uh, we always have done that in the past. When I worked, I would take her on my business trips. Now that she's working, she takes her mom on her business trips. So we're in Charleston. I'm in heaven. I go over to the Charleston Historic Historical Society. And actually, this building, and I always like to um, reference this because, again, this is one of those buildings and museums that most people, they're not aware of, but they're great resources. It's like the old State House Museum. There's so much history here. And as you bring the museum, they're not, they're not like the museums of 50, 100 years ago. These are interactive. You're doing things that increases the audience. You bring in and engage the audience and the local community and you really do a lot with imparting some education and knowledge, and we have to keep that. So we move along again, and here I am in the Charleston Historical Society at a desk. I'm in history. This building, they completed it in 1855, exactly 10 years before the Civil War because Charleston, as you may recall, they were the last ones to, you know, leave the Union, and then they fired the first guns there in Charleston. Well, I go there, and I start going through all of these different records and files, and lo and behold, the Glovers are there, and they have been there through the 1700s. What was interesting too is that the Glover's family itself, they were not blood. Their slaves were Glover's. They took their name. And that's how my, grand, my great grandfather was Glover. And he was Henry Clay Glover. The last time they had him in the census was 1870 in Charleston. The next time he was in Garland County. And then that was the continuation of Henry Charles, uh, Henry Clay Glover. Henry's tend, they tend in Arkansas to have Henry's. My father was a Henry. His father was, uh, well, his grandfather was a Henry. There were some other Henry's because of their brothers and siblings. And then on my father's mother's side, my great-grandfather was Henry. So it was interesting to find all these things, but I think what really intrigued me more was to know that I had been able to trace that particular route. I'm, I, and, and what's interesting too, once you start, you don't stop right there. You think I'm gonna start, it just kind of stop and say, oh, well, Charleston is where it came. No, it was a major, major port for not only slaves, but trade from Europe and um, Spain. They were all, because it was a merchant town. Um, but I always had this curiosity and fascination of hot springs. I remember my grandmother, Pearl Ware Glover, 
would send me letters. And then when my dad would come to town, he would always talk about, oh, you know, I want you to go to Hot Springs and you'll meet your grandparents and you'll meet your aunts and your uncles. And I would, in my mind, I would think, what is this place? It almost sounds like a, you know, a fairy tale land. But I kept researching it more. And then I would remember the little letters that my grandmother would write to me. And I was maybe about seven or eight years. And the way she would just talk, it was, I made a connection with her and we spoke and we would write, but she died before I was actually able to get to meet her in person and my grandfather, uh, John Dixon Glover. So with having all of that knowledge, I just kept searching and searching. But what happened, interestingly, Every time I would go to look for a new relative or where they had descended, this record over onto this online, Henry Glover kept popping up. And I kept thinking, I want to learn a little bit more about everyone. But then I'd research a little something else and it'd say, Henry Glover, composer, songwriter, producer, a and R, and I'm thinking, what is going on with this? Because he died in 91, and he lived in New York, and I was born and raised in Cincinnati. And it really brings us to this point because I was not the only one that had this interest. People such as yourself, folks, real music historians, music enthusiasts, librarians, just overall who appreciate it, the music in that era. And they were familiar with Henry. Most people didn't know that he had composed, written these songs, because that's the nature of a composer and producer that usually they don't record themselves. And, you know, that gets into another language about the record companies. But I try to keep it simplified to say that you might not have heard of Henry Glover, but have you heard of, and I've heard you say that, um, Stephen, and then also I've heard you as well, Daniel, to say, well, you know, um, when, when it comes to that, you might not know who Henry Glover is, but maybe you've heard the song Fever. That was the original composition by Henry. Maybe you've heard of Drowning in My Own Tears, another one, but you heard it performed by Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, the Delmore brothers, they were blue, stay away from me. So you didn't recognize the composer and who wrote it, which I found troubling. I you had your faculties discovered with your dad, with Henry Glover, the composer? It's not like you were in your genealogy time. Oh, that was just 10 years ago. Right. So yeah. What, just what was your concept for you found out? Well, I was trying to learn about the relatives on his side and my mother's side too, and usually know more about maternal. And when I started to look and then I had the technology, it wasn't like going to the historical societies. I could go on all of these copyrights, songs produced. They were through the Library of Congress. We got a lot of information. That's when they were just coming out with Wikipedia. So all this information just started to flow in. And then because I was more in the nonprofit in education, the music and recording business was, I was really unfamiliar with. But I wanted to make sure that my father was recognized for all the work that he had done during that period. And again, when we started to talk about genres of music, that was another learning piece for me. I never, I just enjoyed music and liked to perform and things, but didn't think of all the different genres that he had written and composed songs. And he was quite a musician um, and he knew how to read, write, and he was very, very creative when it, when it came to that. Oh yes, yes. He, he conducted a lot of orchestras. That one is from Italy. Yeah, yeah he's in Italy um, conducting the symphony orchestra over there. So 
But I, I was wondering, so you, there, what was your concept of what your dad did before you found out that he was a composer? As an as a child growing up, well, was he was his name? father. He was he was father. He lived in New York. He would come to Cincinnati. He was a record executive for King Records. So he came there frequently. He ran the New York studio record company. And as an African-American holding those kinds of positions, they, were, they weren't common at the time. So when he came to town, and he was a talent scout too, he would, I didn't, you know, he like Willie John, Little Willie John, all of those performing Delmore Brothers, um, Grandpa Jones, all of these, he's, he was recording. And we didn't know about it because, of, of course, the Delmore brothers, they have performed the songs. And when they think, hear a song, they go, oh, Delmore brothers. Well, actually, they were all together in recording this. And fortunately, another thing I think is real important is oral histories. And we need to do more of those. They have been invaluable. I've come across a couple of oral histories that were pretty in depth. And they just, he talks, he talks in first person, the actual interview him. And there again, I think that that's what's been another platform to learn about what he was doing in the music industry during that mid-century. I call it mid-century pop. Oh, yes, yes. I'm like, we are? <laughs> but, but, yeah. but you didn't know the, the extent of his compositions until you did the genealogy. You just thought he was more of a record executive guy. You didn't know he was even writing. Is that what I, I, I came from a home. My mother was a social worker, and my bonus dad, he was a warden, and we just weren't around music. And so when Henry would come, he, you know, he, I think he liked to get, you know, get away from that studio. So we would just do fun things together. He loved photography. And I recently had a number of the slides that he took back during, cause I was maybe about four or five years old um, in some of our local parks in Cincinnati. And they're just, just absolutely priceless photos. Not that, you know, they're of me, but <laughs> <laughs> just so happened. Um, so they, I had them finally converted from slides to photos and they are just outstanding. So again, that was that process of learning more and more because many of my relatives and even his friends and colleagues and cohorts, they had passed on. He officially would have turned 100 in May of last year. So we're piecing all these things together based a lot on the oral histories and then on the research. What was also developing, because when I first began, there wasn't a lot of the information about how the music business and what the recording and then all of the different types of uh, ways that they would do performing rights, mechanical rights. Well, those were just whole new worlds for me. But since I'm curious, I certainly wanted to see further. Well, as I, of course, mentioned, as I had gone along, I was like, well, this is amazing. This man, and I really approached it more from like, this man has done all of this and no one really knows about it now. And that started to really trouble me. I, I think this is the first time I've admitted that because I thought it was great to get to know about my family on both sides, but I couldn't separate the two. This man was an exceptional in his arena and in his field, like many great artists, like a Picasso, the, during their lifetime, they're not recognized, but the music industry still, it works a little bit different. It's not even like a movie industry where you can go back and see that movie and then at the end of the movie, everybody's gonna be given their credits. I, I've sat and watched at the end of music, at, at, at the end of a movie, and I'm just amazed at how many pieces and puzzles and folks that handle all that, and, and again, that, piqued my curiosity. 
So as I'm pulling all these pieces together for my father, I'm thinking, you know, we need to do something like that for him. He really deserves that because somewhere along the line, and I don't point a finger, I just think that maybe people were too involved in their own lives, and then there was a change in the music. He recorded in R&B, country, bluegrass, gospel, and even jazz. And to think that he was so unique in his approach that he would develop the song, the melody, the lyrics, they would all be in one fashion, but then he would change it to a country beat and sound. And then he would take the same country and then they would perform it in R&B. And he and Sid Nathan, and Sid Nathan was the president and founder of King Records in Cincinnati. And he, the two of them collaborated a lot. He liked Henry's mind, and then he had the business know-how, and the two of them, I mean, they were very quiet, you know, they were very close. And he didn't, and one thing I like to always think of Sid is that he was colorblind. And when you grow up in an environment where it's colorblind, when you get older and as you grow older, you never see the color, you see the individual. And that's how I grew up knowing. And when Henry would come to town, we weren't one in one area or one or the other. He would come in and he was such a gracious gentleman and he was head to toe, Imagine in the 50s, this man comes in, he's larger than life, he's suits, tailor-made clothes, articulate, fun-loving, and this guy is your father. Mm -hmm. And then, I, of course, I was interested at, back during that time. I didn't know these whole stories. I had to, like, really do a little investigation. So I said, well, how? I asked my mother, I said, well, how did you two meet? And you see the photo of the two of them there, okay? And she says, well, I was working at the Man's Hotel in Cincinnati, which was an African-American hotel, because back during the 50s and 40s, you could not, you know, African-Americans couldn't stay in regular hotels, and so, the African-American business community in various cities, they developed these different hotels and you know houses where people could stay. And they even have a black book that listed all of the hotels where a traveler could go. The man's hotel had, I mean, ball players, celebrities, all kind of VIPs, government at this hotel. Well, on this particular occasion, I would say around 1953, Henry rolls into Cincinnati, goes to check into the man's hotel, and back behind the counter, there's this little switchboard operator, and it was my mother. <laughs> so it, it's going to, from there, it was like instant, instant chemistry. You know, he says, I want to meet her. Who is she? You know, and of course, my mom was about 10 years younger. So she was, you know, excited about this. And from there, they were planning a wonderful life together. And uh, then I came along in 55. Life got a little bit complicated because then there were choices to make. And he, during that time too, King Records, Sid Nathan, he passed away. And some other things happened business-wise, but then Henry didn't come to Cincinnati as often. And then my mom, she remarried, and that's how the separation came. We stayed in contact. And um, I always thought with, because it was an easy back during that time, you couldn't just pick up your cell phone, you couldn't text, you couldn't email, you couldn't FaceTime. So it was pretty limited communication. Um, but I always felt like there was a purpose and there was a reason for what I was about to embark on. I had no idea what it was. 
I, I still don't really know, but I'm just following the process. And that pretty much brings us up to date. He was um, in Cincinnati. That's where he met my mother. She was, um, I think he was, they were very, very much in love. And when I look at the pictures, yeah, when I look at the pictures, they, they really do give you that impression and they speak to these were two people that were really, really fond of each other. Can you tell us about growing up in Cincinnati? Was it a pretty tough town segregation or that kind of thing? How was your, how was Actually, it was above the Mason-Dixon line. And we went to Catholic schools. Our, our parents always made sure we went to private schools from K through 12. And between the teachers, primarily nuns, that educated me, it was a great experience though. Okay. <laughs> and in terms of segregation, Cincinnati in that part, it, it was not like the South. We were considered the North. And again, when I talk about that, that ability that you, you're colorblind, that's why I think when, when, when my father would come to Cincinnati, he didn't experience that because number one, you had Sid Nathan at King Records. Um, he had an integrated workforce that at that time it was unheard of. So you were always surrounded with folks from different backgrounds, ethnicities, religions, and it just shaped where I am today. Um, can, you, can you tell us more about like, what Cincinnati was like for you as a kid, uh, growing up there with Bill and Mary? I tell you, I think I had one of the best childhoods. And when I, and I've been fortunate to have lifelong friends. One of my friends, uh, Marilyn, she lived in the same two family. And we, they were on the first, the second floor, we were on the first. We also went to the same Catholic school. We would walk to school, but we were about the same age. Well, she was like two years older, but we were typical kids. We rode our bikes all through the neighborhood. In fact, we would be, I, I can remember riding my bike from Walnut Hills to Eden Park, and my girlfriend, Marilyn, she was right there. We would ride all over the place, and we, we really liked to perform and sing, so we did a, we were early, they pantomiming and putting together different little shows and groups, and now they call it karaoke. But we were the, they were the queens back during the day. We had it so well organized. And I don't know if it's that music DNA that kind of flowed through. I thought everybody, I, I mean, I, I didn't think anything about me was really that exceptional because no one made a big deal. It's like, oh, yeah, well, she's really good at this. She's really good at that. She's got an ear. She's but da. And I'm thinking, yeah, most people do. And the same with the father. Um, Henry would call when he was at, in New York. He'd call Cincinnati. I'd be outside playing. And uh, my grandmother would come to the back door and she'd say, your daddy from New York is on the phone. And I would, you know, say, yay, go in, talk. And just, you know, the typical house school going, he'd ask me, you know, I'll see you soon. We're going to take you, you know, you're going to go visit your grandparents out in Hot Springs. And then I'd say, bye, love you back outside. I thought everybody had two daddies. One that was in the house that my warden dad, and then my dad in New York. Nothing unusual about that to me. <laughs> so that was pretty much my early life. And then I had a, a really good childhood. Um, that, I was wondering about your school. Were there that many black Catholics in Cincinnati? Was it the integrated Catholic it was integrated. In fact, they're more integrated now. But in the neighborhoods that we were in, there wasn't this line and division. We were all in the same neighborhood. And, you know, in fact, our neighbors across the street, they were white and their daughter, they, she went to, we were in the same class and we would walk to school. And we had all kind of activities because being, being in a private setting, they always do a lot of different extracurriculars. So I grew up around diversity. And um, when we, even when we moved on to our first 
big, really home, everybody, because um, my parents worked real hard and they were coming up, pulling themselves up by the boat straps, so to speak. And uh, again, we were one of the, we were the first that moved on Lois Drive in Cincinnati of uh, blacks, but our neighbors were all Jewish. And just some of the best folks that you ever, ever wanted to know. So all through my life, it's been integrated. When I went on to high school, Mount Notre Dame in Cincinnati, it's all girl private school, and it was integrated. The nuns, I think, played an important role in making folks feel accepted and not judging people by the color of their skin. I always remembered those. Those nuns never made me feel like I was anything but Sherry, and they judged everything on Sherry. And I really attribute that. And I have um, some really close nuns that I've stayed in contact with, uh -huh. and, yeah. And um, like I said, I just felt it was a great education. Um, my parents and they all put together so that I would be exposed to a lot. I traveled very early on at about 12. Of course, people, they travel earlier, but I was around 12 and went all throughout the country from Niagara Falls to Washington, the tours, and we would go down to the Smoky Mountains and then to Florida. And then when I got, when I turned about 14, my family, they knew of a Bohemian family and I was in Florida with some family friends. And they, as they said, well, you know, we've got these relatives over in Nassau and um, they've got some, some teenagers about your age. And why don't you go over and see them? Well, of course I'm 14 years old. Can you imagine? I'm gonna say no. But <laughs> it was, a, so here I arrive at 14 years old in a Caribbean country, never knew that you drove on the left-hand side of the road. They picked me up at the airport. I'll never forget this. Zip out, they drive very fast, you know, and they pull out of the airport, driving me down on the left side, going 50 miles an hour, and I thought to myself, oh, so this is how it's gonna end. You just, <laughs> so you bring me all the way here, and then we're going to like go off to the left, okay? I, and so I was so happy to learn that, <laughs> I know I did, I thought it was just, this was it, you know? We're gonna have a crash and they send my body back to Ohio. <laughs> But then I started, um, my parents would send me every summer. So I spent my summers in the Bahamas. And again, kind of unusual, don't you think? Yeah, and they still are like my extended family. When I go, even now, because I've stayed in contact with them, and I go, and when you go into their lines, you know, when you enter into a country and then you've got to go through um, customs. They'll have two lines, tourists and returning Bohemians. They motion me over to the returning Bohemians, so I don't even feel like a tourist when I'm there. <laughs> when you first started the story, they said Bohemians, and I kept waiting for these guys they're Bahamians. I meant to say Bahamians. Yeah, yeah. Bahamian. Yeah, they're they're Bahamian. If I said that, I gotta correct myself. And I interchange it sometime because I'm talking fast and I yeah, but but uh, Bohemian is a type of what 50s, 60s character, right? Laid back and they were the hippie scene or beatniks. Yeah. But a Baham, you know, a person from the Bahamas, they are considered Bahamian, but the way they pronounce it is very different. When I would go and they would, we'd go around, we were going, having fun at the beach and the parties and all the other fun stuff. And they'd say, oh, who is that? And they would think I was Bohemian or Bahamian, 
But when I started talking, they say, oh, that's the American girl. <laughs> that's the American girl. She's here. But yeah, that would always give me away was by lack of an accent. And um, those were my days in um, my teenage years. And following that, I think I went like a typical road, started college, career, marriage, um, and along the way just kept developing. I, I didn't have that real sense of family and connection. That only really developed in the last 10, 20 years because I think I mentioned on the onset that I traveled a lot and I would come to different folks and places and I would have this sense of, I've been here before or there's a connection here. And that's happened a couple of times, but those others were on my maternal side with my, with my mother. So I'm always in this process of trying to, I, I think they have a couple of those stories that say, um, do you know who you are? Or, um, finding your roots and all those kinds of things. And I'm, I, can, I can say, I've been there. I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm on my way. And the fun part of those, too, is that as you go back and research with the technology, too, they're finding they can go back through all matching up of all the ancestries and things. So I'm pleased to say I'm back into like the 1700s, like the 1780s. Um, and that's another interesting story at some point. But the Glovers out of Charleston, they came to Arkansas. And then the other folks that, you know, they married into, in fact, they were already here in Arkansas. So mm -hmm. the Wares, yeah. And the Dixons, I'm finding oh, wow. that, that that was my grandfather's, uh, what would have been my great grandmother. Her maiden name was Dixon. Ella Dixon, yeah. Where did the Catholicism come from? Is that from Marion? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Marion, yeah. He was Baptist, but you know, we accepted everyone's religion and that you grow up that way. It's like now I've been able to connect with our family church here in Hot Springs and it's Baptist. I walk into the Baptist Church at Roanoke, and I feel like I've been there before. I feel this sense of presence that there are these ancestors that are all surrounding me, and they're kind of like giving me a nice little nod. We like what you're doing, kid. Keep it up kind of thing. And yeah, that's, that's my story. <laughs>